It's time for John Coggeshall and Harden me for all seeking pardons or roll clemency. Inmates deserving who could be served. everybody, it's John Cogashaw. Everybody calls me Cog, and this is my Cogcast. And today, we're learning about a deserving pardon petitioner named Elton McEachin. And I'd like to read his letter to the governor. Why was a jerk like me able to cause such destruction to nice people working hard in the bank to provide for their family? Yeah, it was a BB gun. Nobody got hurt. But at that time in my life, I was self-centered, selfish, and I thought the world owed me for allowing my mother to get killed when I was 13. In the early stages of my life, I did not value anything, and I had no understanding of the consequences of my actions. I lived for the day with no regard to the future or my family. When I was running the streets, I had no idea that my family loved me the way they do. I thought I was on my own and made decisions that reflect that. At the age of 13, I saw my mother get killed. On January 13, 1989, which was Friday the 13th, my brothers and I were having a sleepover. We were playing with our Nintendo when all of a sudden I heard something that sounded like fireworks. As I entered the living room to see what was going on, I saw my mother on the floor and the man standing in the doorway with a gun in his hand. I immediately stood in front of her and said, leave my mommy alone. He turned and ran out the front door. I turned towards my mother and get her to her feet. We walked to the next door neighbors and my mother collapsed in the driveway. I sat beside her crying. She rolled her head towards me and said everything would be okay. At that moment, I was able to really see what had happened. And I saw a lot of blood. And I told her it was not okay. And I started crying harder. All of a sudden, I felt something poke me in the hip, and when I looked down, I saw her bone where her elbow was supposed to be. Oh, my God, I lost it and started screaming for help. While I was looking around to get somebody's attention, I noticed a shadow of a man walking down the road, and I asked him to help my mother. He went into a house and called the police. The paramedics attended to my mother, and they put me and my two brothers and our friend in the front seat of the ambulance. We were taken to the police station, and for the first time, I was able to breathe and think about what just happened. As I looked over myself, I noticed for the first time that I was covered in blood from head to toe. With a closer look, I noticed they had little chunks of her on my clothes. When this happened, we were living in South Carolina, and our closest relative lived in North Carolina. So we waited in a small room for hours until my mother's sister and her husband arrived. That night, we got a hotel room, and the next day, we went to the hospital. While in the waiting room, I remembered the doctors talking about how my mother was at the ICU. Immediately, I asked my aunt, if I could use the bathroom, but my real intentions were to find my mother. As I walked down the hallways, I read all the signs until I found one that read, I see you. I followed the signs until I found that unit. When I entered the unit, I started to read the names on the doors until I found the door with her name on it. When I saw my mother in that bed with all those tubes in her body, I didn't recognize her. I I looked at the name again, and it was her name. So I looked at her arm and saw that it was amputated at the elbow. At that point, I knew that the figure I was looking at was my mother. 
I turned around and returned to the waiting room, curled up in my chair and started crying. Everyone was asking me what was wrong. I could not tell them because I was scared I would get in trouble. That is the moment I started keeping my emotions bottled up. And that is when I knew how bad my mother was hurt. Two days later, she died. And the unconditional love that a child gets from their parent died too. Later, I remembered my mother telling someone on the phone a few nights before she was murdered uh, that the man was mad at her because she would not have sex with him. And they were arguing about who owned the telephone. I never received any counseling for the things I witnessed I did not even know I needed counseling until I became incarcerated and started talking to the prison psychiatrist. They found the man who killed my mother. I found out that he had killed another woman before. I felt so betrayed by the justice system. In my mind, I was let down by the justice system. I felt like they all owed me. My dad was alive at the time. He was a very heavy drinker who always found a way to beat my brothers and I for something we did the week while he was intoxicated. The way he disciplined us was with his belt. He would tell us to stand against the door with our hands up like the police are searching us, and then it hit us over the back with that leather belt. I remember one night while getting beaten, my dad bragged that smoke was coming off of my back while he was hitting me. I would never wish that type of discipline on anyone. He died of cancer about five years ago. As an adult, my father and I reconciled and I had a better relationship with him. But as a child, it was pretty devastating. After my mother's death, I went to live with an uncle and aunt they introduced me to a whole different world. I started playing sports, going camping, and I was a member of 4-H. Everything was fine for several years. Midway through my junior year of high school, I decided to go joyriding with my friends. What made me go joyriding? That week in school, I just finished exams and we were allowed to stay home that Friday. I decided to stay home and called a few buddies over to hang out. I wanted to be cool, and we decided to take a spin. I knew my aunt and uncle would be upset, but not to the point of kicking me out of the house. I have no idea why they only gave me one chance. Years later, when I asked why they gave me just that one chance, they said that the joyriding was the straw that broke the camel's back. They said I had made a $30 purchase to buy a girl some flowers, which I don't remember doing. Um, they all said uh, that. And however, I do remember breaking curfew a couple of times and I didn't wear some clothes they gave me because I didn't think they were cool. Anyway, the joy riding apparently was the straw that broke the camel's back. They packed my bags and kicked me out. When they did that without any real explanation, I felt worthless because I thought I'd been good and respectful leading up to that. In my eyes, I was abandoned by the people who were supposed to care for me. Well, after that, I lived with an aunt for a few months, and then that summer, I moved into an apartment with two girls I met. They were sisters. Well, one of them is the mother of my oldest daughter. During my senior year, I eventually dropped out of school and began doing whatever made me feel significant. I just wanted to belong to a part of something. The guys in the streets accepted me for who I was, so I ran with them for a while. During this time, I was having sexual relationships with another girl which led to my second daughter. I was stealing cars, making unauthorized purchases with lost or stolen credit cards, and driving without a license. 
big time. That was me. Even though I was doing these things, now I knew deep down that I was going to live the life as an outlaw for a little while and have some adventuresome stories to tell my grandkids. But going to school and getting my master's degree was always a part of the plan. Being a father is something I wanted. The birth of my girls was the blessing that made me once again try to turn over a new leaf. And I really did start to distance myself from what I was and moving towards who I wanted to be. In September of 2000, my brother and I got an apartment. Later that uh, same uh, day, I, I enrolled in a, in a local college. I was working at a furniture store as a furniture salesman. I loved my little girls, and it felt good supporting them like a man should. Yeah, my checks weren't big, but the future looked bright. I was in college, and I knew that was a better education. I'd be able to make more money. Everything was going pretty good until I got summoned to child support court. Child support hit me hard, but I was working so hard to straighten my life out. But as soon as I started doing good, the mother of my youngest child rushed to child support court to get more money. The other mother of my other child did the same thing a week later. I was already splitting my checks with them. On top of that, somebody went to my apartment and destroyed all my furniture. Even though life was challenging, I was holding on and doing well until one day an old classmate stopped by with cocaine in his possession. Not understanding my own addictive nature, that triggered the old guy I was trying to put behind me. That one day using drugs took me for a ride, and I was back hanging in the streets again. I met another guy who I allowed to influence me into, believe it or not, robbing a bank. This type of activity was never in my nature. My mother raised me better than that. But being under the influence of drugs and the wrong crowd made this kind of decision-making easier. Because the mothers of my daughters were being so impatient, I decided to rob a bank with a BB gun so I could give them all the money they wanted. I wanted to look at the two women and say, look what you made me do. I was thinking that four or five years behind bars would give me the time I needed to restart my life. Prison seemed better than the life I was living. My way of thinking was irrational. And I know there are better ways to handle my problems, but I didn't know it back then. One night, I was watching the news, and I saw a guy who got five years for robbing a bank. That's where I got the idea. I didn't care if I got caught, so I did not cover my face or wear gloves. Getting away with the crime was not my main concern. For every crime I committed, I always pled guilty because I was guilty. However, I would like a sentence more appropriate to the crimes I committed. Robbing a bank with a BB gun and hurting no one. For me, there's no possibility of parole and 54 years in prison seems extreme. I've been incarcerated since February 9th, 2001. I've truly turned my life around. The right decisions I have made has led to better choices. Eventually, this has brought genuine people into my life. Genuine. With time, I also was able to see the value of life and how short it is. Life is about helping others and maybe putting a smile on their face. Life is about teaching the next generation how to be their best. Life is about loving your family and spending as much time as you can with them before the Lord calls you home. That is what life means to me now. As a young man, I needed to find structure and discipline. Unfortunately for me, I found that in prison. 
The Department of Corrections is a blessing for those who can look past the negativity of prison and see all the programs and vocational classes at our fingertips. At the beginning of my sentence, I was so mad and disappointed in myself that I could not see the tools available to me. <clears throat> but about seven years ago, I awoke and decided to take advantage of every program that was available. I still remember that morning when my life changed for the better. I literally woke up a new man, and I wanted to better myself no matter the conditions or situation. Being around a bunch of grumpy people can take its toll, but I shook it off. During my transformation to be the best person ever, I made changes. First, I took my Christian duties seriously. Second, I started to learn and accept myself, love myself. Once I did that, I started enrolling in programs to upgrade my education and academics. The more I achieved, the better I felt. The better I felt, the more I got involved with my family, especially my daughters, Deja and Cheyenne. Deja, my oldest daughter, and I have the best relationship in the world. We talk on the phone at least once a day, and she usually calls me as much as she can. And she stops by to see me uh, about every time, about once every 90 days, I think, is what, what we can work out with the prison system. Did wrong and that I should be punished, but she thinks that the sentence I received is excessive. As far as my other daughter, Cheyenne, goes, our relationship is a work in progress. Last year, she wrote me a letter explaining to me that she was ready to forgive me for not being there and that she understands that we all make mistakes. Our relationship is getting better. She sends letters off and on through the kiosk. She wants me in her life. And she wants to live with me and be my little girl once released. Boy, I'd love to take care of her. For the first time in my life, I see firsthand how making the right choices leads to a better lifestyle. Now I'm addicted to making the right decisions, so I enroll in the GED program. I attend classes regularly, and I pay attention. Within seven months, I pass the test. Thank God I have a GED now, but I wanted more. So I signed up to take some college courses, which was great. After that was complete, I took classes to be a GED tutor and completed that course. I went from being a student to a tutor. That was a big accomplishment for me. And I started to see my resume build. At that time, I had no idea where this could lead, but I knew that educating myself would take me beyond anything I could imagine. With that in mind, I enrolled in Intro to Computers. My whole life, I've always been fascinated by computers, and now I had chance to learn about them. As I learned more things, I started to blossom. The more I learned, the more education I wanted. Now I can design websites. I can do PowerPoint, Windows, uh, Word, Access, Excel, all of them. After completing that course, I started taking business software applications courses and completed them. I still wanted more. So I enrolled in advanced business software applications and completed that. I was class valedictorian for the 2018 graduating class, and my speech was about love for life and education. And I am currently enrolled in Microsoft Office specialty courses. Now that I have learned all these cool things, I would love to use them in the real world and see how far I can go. I'm not done educating myself because I want to earn a master's degree. Now I know what is required to obtain what I want and the rewards that come with it. I can see myself speaking at churches, group homes, banquets, universities, conventions, and business seminars. I want to inspire others utilizing my story. Now I'm sitting in a cell wearing a face guard because of COVID-19 and writing this letter. 
I never thought that making a commitment to better myself would lead me to do this. Governor, with your help, I would like to continue my educational journey. Last month, I asked my daughters if they would travel with me and attend speeches, and they said yes. That would be so nice to have my girls with me as I got in front of a crowd and delivered my speech. Governor, give me a chance to show that side of me. I have the desire and work ethic to be a figure that the community wants and needs. For bread and butter issues, my daughter and son-in-law have a flooring business and they will employ me. They want me to be a licensed contractor, which is fine. And they're willing to give me the flexibility I need to talk to the community. There is an outstanding group of people who have invested a lot into me because they believe I'm worth the trouble. That touches my heart and I am overjoyed with emotion. I matter now. And I haven't had that feeling since my mother was alive. That feeling is truly a great one. Thank you for hearing my story. Respectfully, Elton McEachin. I'd like to talk a few minutes about Elton McEachin, who we call a man remade. At the age of 13, Mr. McEachin saw his mother murdered. He says, every day was a struggle because the only person I really admired was gone. I felt the world owed me because they let the assailant free for a while. On the outside, I was happy, but internally I was crying for help. Without my mother, I felt lost, vulnerable, and the unconditional love I was used to was suddenly gone. He began using drugs to mask the pain. This led to Mr. McEachin dealing with some very shady characters. Life was better when I was high, he said. Although the guys in the streets had rough upbringings, they accepted me with all my flaws. In addition, Mr. McEachin looked for love in the wrong places, trying to replace the mother's love he once felt. He never found that unconditional love, but he did end up with two beautiful daughters. With the birth of his daughters, he realized that he needed to make some lifestyle changes. He found a job as a salesman and enrolled in college classes at a local college. Unfortunately, the lifestyle was short-lived. An old friend stopped by with cocaine, and his life quickly spiraled out of control. Before he knew it, Mr. McEachin was back on the street. This time, his life on the street took a nasty turn when he met a man who talked Mr. McEachin into robbing a bank. They went to Walmart and got a BB gun. He says, I believe that as long as we didn't hurt anyone, it would be okay. That's the biggest lie I ever told myself, unquote. Mr. McEachin now realizes that his crime was anything but victimless. He says, nobody should have to go to work and endure the agony, mental trauma, and defensiveness those bank tellers endured. I keep those people in my prayers and I hope they are surrounded by love. Mr. McEachin and his buddy were apprehended within minutes of robbing the bank. Mr. McEachin admitted to the crime immediately because he knew that he had committed a criminal act. Since his incarceration, his views on life have changed. Mr. McEachin no longer feels like the abandoned child his mother's death left him feeling. He no longer feels a sense of entitlement and finding God. He has also found forgiveness and the love for the man he has become. Now he works hard to be a good father to his two daughters. His oldest daughter waited to get married. Hopefully she wanted her father to take her down the aisle. That, that didn't happen, but he's still very close to his daughter and his new son-in-law. His fondest memories include having his infant daughters fall asleep on his chest and singing nursery rhymes to him. 
Mr. McEachin has signed up for every program of vocational class offered. He's earned and received certificates of completion for GED, GED Tutor, Thinking for a Change, Intro to Computers, Business Software Applications, Advanced BSA from James Madison Community College. He is currently taking Microsoft Office Specialist classes, and he was handpicked by the instructor to take that class. Ultimately, he is working towards earning his associates. Once released, he plans to complete classes and go farther than an associate's degree. He has immediate employment working for his daughter's flooring company. And Mr. McKeachin hopes to serve his community by sharing his story to help others recognize a friend or loved one seeking guidance. And I'd like to share with you a letter that his beloved daughter Deja wrote for Mr. McKeachin. And she says, my name is Deja, and I am the daughter of Elton McEachin. I'm currently a senior at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, where I'm pursuing a bachelor's degree in biochemistry. I am married as of March 2017 to Lucas. Even under the circumstances, me and my father's relationship is strong. My dad never missed a beat, even though he couldn't be there physically he has always made sure he was there in spirit by drawing me pictures, writing me sweet letters, and calling me anytime he got a chance. He never failed to make me feel loved. To him, I am the most important person in his life and his number one fan. Our conversations usually consist of my well-being, my education, and our family. Now that I am an adult, I feel as though I can talk to him about anything and he has my back. I believe in my father so much. I went as far as raising the money for my father's pardon petition. This was no easy feat, as my family is low income, but there is no price on my father's well-being. That being said, my father contributes back by selling his paintings and working at his facility as a mural painter. To help me with my finances, he sends me $25 every month. It isn't a lot, but to me, it means the world. I could go into the past, but I would like to focus on the present and future in hopes that our family can come together once again. My father has completed many programs to assist in helping broaden his job scopes. In February, me and my husband purchased our first home in North Carolina. We began our construction company in 2017. We have made a comfortable life in North Carolina and hope to welcome my father, Elton McEachin, into our home and our lives. While he transitions from the institution to home life, he will have a home with me and a job as a construction worker after being trained. After he saves money, he'll be able to find more career options if he so chooses. I strongly believe my father has made the most of his time being institutionalized and has grown, matured, and found how important decision-making is and how it can impact not only yourself, but your family. After missing, watching me grow up and family members passing, he can see how important life choices are and that we must all consider that in our future endeavors. If we are so lucky to get a second chance at making our family whole again, we will make the most of it. Elton McEachin can't wait to be a team player on my team. That's the story of Elton McEachin. Thanks for joining me on our podcast video. I am John Coggeshall. This is my podcast, and I'll see you next time when we'll talk about another deserving pardon petitioner. Until then, check out the website, www.johnacogashaw.com, and uh, just hang loose. Bye.